One of the most iconic quotes from Alice in Wonderland is when the caterpillar asks Alice, who are you? It seems like such a simple answer, but she can't even begin to answer it. The scene continues with Alice explaining that she doesn't know who she is since she's changed so much during her time in Wonderland. As the interaction continues, she says to the caterpillar, well, if you ask me, in which the caterpillar interrupts her and asks once again, who are you? This scene dives into so many thoughts about identity and the concept of what the individual is. Identity is a broad concept in philosophy, though. It can be more than just the properties we use to define ourselves. The problems of personal identity range from the idea of who one is, to personhood, persistence, evidence, population, and what am I? All these areas focus on different aspects of what we call personal identity and how we define it. Even more complicated is that who one is may not stop where their skin ends. It's very possible that the individual extends beyond their own physical self. This is False Perception with your host, Lefty Philosophy, and in this episode, we are going to ask, who are you? One big concept that plays into the idea of who one is, is the fact that humans experience consciousness. The entity we talk to in our own head when we make decisions. The inner voice as I write this script. The accumulation of all my senses into one cohesive thing. This entity that I feel is me. Without this conscious experience, answering the question of who we are as individuals would be quite easy. We would be robots or machines that simply react to input with a pre-programmed code. Our consciousness gives us the feeling that we are something more than just the regurgitation of our experiences. But is that really the case? Can one be anything other than what they have already experienced? Can one want to go to a city or a place that they're not aware of? Why is it that one doesn't know about that place? And if they did, would it change their own wants and desires in traveling to that place? For instance, what if they really wanted to go and visit Rome, but then found out about the existence of Greece, and that knowledge changed their wants and desires to travel to Rome and they instead went to Greece? Does the introduction of new information change our decisions? Do we even make decisions on our own? Or is our consciousness something that we just experience for the sake of evolution? Defining who one is isn't as simple as one's name, place of birth, or color of their skin. These things help shape the person, but do not actually define who they are. Two people can both be named Jim, born in Austin, Texas, and have the same exact brown skin tone. However, they will not be identical people. So the essence of who one is is a lot more complex than just some descriptive elements of one's past, present, and future. It's more than their physical characteristics. It's more than just their current aesthetic. Who one is, is just as complex as asking why the universe exists. One problem of personal identity is who am I? Personal identity usually refers to properties to which we feel a special sense of attachment or ownership. These properties are the building blocks that make us who we are. To have an identity crisis is to become unsure of what one's most characteristic properties are, of what sort of person, in some deep and fundamental sense, one is. This is not the same as the identity crisis put forth by psychologist Eric Erickson. His theory states, The crisis is one of heightened susceptibility to particular developmental changes associated with puberty. Teenagers experience rapid changes in body build, hormones, emotions, and cognitive ability. Perhaps for the first time in life, they contemplate their roles in society, including their careers, values, and gender role. One's personal identity in this sense is contingent and temporary. The way I define myself as a person might have been different and can vary from one time to another. It could happen that being a parent and an electrician belong to my identity, but not being a man and living in Texas. However, to someone else, being a man and living in Texas belong to their identity, but not the fact that they're a parent and an electrician. I could also define myself as an electrician, but as soon as I retire, define myself as retired or no longer an electrician since I may not practice the trade anymore. The properties that we use to define ourselves may not be static as time moves on. 
Depending on how the term is defined, it may also be possible for a property to belong to someone's identity without her actually having it. If I become convinced that I am a dog, being a four-legged canine could be one of the properties central to the way I define myself, and thus an element of my identity, even though my belief that I am a dog is false. The next problem of personal identity is called personhood. What is it to be a person? as opposed to a non-person. What have we people got that non-people haven't got? More specifically, we can ask at what point in our development from a fertilized egg there comes to be a person. Or what would it take for a chimpanzee or an alien or an electronic computer to be a person if they ever could be? We could explore these questions with some thought experiments. One of the most famous is called the Turing test. If you have ever seen the movie The Imitation Game, then you are familiar with Alan Turing. If you haven't seen it, go do it. It's an incredible story of one of the most influential minds of our time. The Turing test seeks to answer the question, can machines do what we, as thinking entities, can do? The concept of personhood usually has some aspect of thinking in its definition. This implies that it has a consciousness, which is also another aspect of personhood, and if so, worthy of being called a person. Being called a person is important because it usually has the force of law behind it, or it's given certain protections in our society. Historically, we can see how non-persons, such as slaves and women, have been treated through law because they were not considered persons. Now back to the Turing test. Turing proposes a test inspired by a party game known as the imitation game, in which a man and a woman go into separate rooms and guests try to tell them apart by writing a series of questions and reading the typewritten answers sent back. In this game, both the man and the woman aim to convince the guests that they are the other. Turing described his new version of the game as follows. We now ask the question, what will happen when a machine takes part of A in this game? Will the interrogator decide wrongly as often when the game is played like this as he does when the game is played between a man and a woman? These questions replace our original, can machines think? In short, if a machine could answer questions in a way that a human thought they were in fact another human, does this mean that maybe thinking isn't worth consideration when we're trying to define personhood? If a machine can either successfully think the same way we consider humans to be able to, or imitate thinking to such a degree that it passes as human, it's possible the act of being able to think may no longer be used to define personhood. Historically, the term personhood has been used to discriminate certain elements of society and justify certain treatment to those outside of personhood parameters. If machines can think, then the only difference between human beings and them is the concept of organic versus inorganic material. Personhood would be used to discriminate against machines capable of passing off as humans beyond their physical manifestation. Movies like I Am Robot and Blade Runner explore this concept. The abortion debate in America has also been focused more on the idea of personhood rather than morality. Many believe that if you can define the exact parameters of personhood, then it would be easy to grant fetus protection under the law. However, defining personhood that only pertains to a human fetus has proven to be quite tricky. At what point does a clump of cells become a person? Does it become a person when it can react to stimuli through sensory organs? Does it become a person when the heartbeat begins? Does it become a person at a specific point in time, like three months? Or is it at a specific point in development? like when the brain is developed. These all pertain to the idea of personhood and are currently being debated and explored in the hopes of preventing voluntary abortions. In its basic sense, at what point does an abortion become criminal versus akin to removing a mole? An ideal account of personhood would be a definition of the word person, taking the form, necessarily, x is a person at time t, if and only if blank x blank t blank with the blanks appropriately filled in. The most common answer is that to be a person at some point in time, one must demonstrate certain special mental properties, while others propose a less direct connection between personhood and mental properties. For example, that to be a person is to be capable of acquiring those properties, or to belong to a kind whose members typically have them when healthy and mature. People in comas add a bit of complexity to these types of answers, though. 
Another problem of identity is called persistence. What does it take for a person to persist from one time to another, or to continue existing rather than cease to exist? Persistence historically was brought up to ponder the concept of continuing to exist after physical death. However, it has since been broadened to encompass more than just the death of the body. Let's first look at the concepts surrounding the physical body. How does one know that when they wake up, they are still the same person as they were before they went to bed? How does one know that when they look at an old photograph of them as a child, that the child and the person claiming to be that child are one and the same? It takes about 7 to 10 years for the body to replace every cell other than neurons in the body. A typical person replaces about 330 billion cells a day. This means that aside from your neurons, there isn't one cell that is the same as when the photograph was taken. So how is it still you? Of course, one could say, well, the mind is still there, and that's where you as a person lives. Or one could say that they have a soul, and that, in its basic sense, is what continues on in the body. Both these two answers are very different though. One refers to the body as just being this organic capsule of meat and bones, while the other infers that there's something more than just the physical. A common thought experiment to help explain this concept is that you have an old car in your backyard. It belonged to your dad and you have very fond memories of it. Before he passed, he'd take you out joyriding it. Let's just say that the car no longer runs and the panels are starting to rust off. So you decide to restore it back to its glory to help relive those memories with your dad. You begin by replacing one of the fenders. You added a brand new element that wasn't originally there to begin with. Is it still the same car? Most people would say yes. Well, what if you continued replacing every part on the car until none of the original parts remain? At what point does the car turn into another car? To add more complexity, even after you restored it, it still gave you the same feeling of riding in it with your dad around town as the original car. So while the physical part of the car may no longer exist, the soul, through your memories, of that car does. Now, let's look at persistence through the non-physical. I've already touched on the most well-known concept, the soul. The concept of the soul is not only meant to explain how one as a person continues to exist through time, but also how one could exist for eternity. A lot of religious philosophy uses the concept of the soul to talk about an afterlife, the death of the physical body, that human beings are more than just pounds of flesh and bone, that there is something more to what makes a person a person. As time has gone on, this conversation has gotten a lot more complicated. With technology becoming more and more complex, the concept of the soul can be replaced by consciousness and then asked if one could upload all their data into a robot, would that robot be the same person minus the inorganic nature of its body? Would it be possible to upload one's consciousness into the cloud and live on? This is the same concept as dying and then your soul continuing to heaven, a place where one can live for eternity but not with an organic body. The next problem of identity is called evidence. How do we know who is who? How do we know that the person in front of us is the same person as yesterday? For us individually, first person experience helps meld together the concepts of who we were yesterday to who we are today. We use memory to help meld these timelines together into a congruent person. If you can remember doing something and that something did happen, then that is usually enough to prove that you're that person. Physical continuity is another form of evidence we use. If one sees a video from 10 years ago and it looks like them, we generally agree that it is them. But in what sense? If they are the same person physically, but have no recollection of that moment and have since changed drastically both physically and mentally, is that person really them? Is it only in the sense of their body being continuous, but is the body the only thing that makes them them? Say for instance that two identical twins got into a car accident and lost all memory of who they were. When they regain their memory, they each believe themselves to be the other twin. They regain memories by looking at photographs and movies of themselves, but individually identified as the other twin. If their bodies are the same and their memories align with the other twin, how can you prove to them that they aren't the other? Or what if someone lost their memory and had all their memories replaced by that of a dead celebrity? Let's 
just say Elvis Presley. Does having the memories of Elvis Presley make one Elvis Presley? Does having the exact same body, in the case of the identical twins, and memories make one twin the other? So then what evidence can we use to determine who people say they are? Another problem of personal identity is called population. This one is kind of weird since we think that the number of people on Earth is an empirical concept, that we can count each person on this planet. Birth records are normally how we accomplish this, but this doesn't paint the full picture. Do we count people with multiple personalities as one person? Just because they only have one body, does that mean it's only one person? But if we count the body, then are conjoined twins who have two separate and conscious brains just one person? Or what happens when the main connections between the cerebral hemispheres are severed and two consciousness appear in one body? Do we count that just as one person? And now we come to the last problem of personal identity. What are you? This question revolves around the metaphysics of what things human beings are. If you don't know what metaphysics is, it's kind of hard to explain in a short sentence. But in a very general sense, it's a branch of philosophy that studies the fundamental nature of reality. The first principles of being, identity and change, space and time, cause and effect, necessity and possibility. Examples of things one might ask under the problem of what are you are, what are our fundamental properties in addition to those that make us people? What, for instance, are we made of? Are we composed entirely of matter as rocks are, or are we partly or wholly immaterial? Where do our spatial boundaries lie if we are spatially extended at all? Do we extend all the way out to our skin and no further? If so, what fixes those boundaries? Are we substances, metaphysically independent beings, or is each of us a state or aspect or activity of something else? Some of the main answers to these questions are, we're just biological organisms. We are material things constituted by organisms. A person made up of the same matter as a certain animal, but they are different things because what it takes for them to persist is different. We are temporal parts of animals. Each of us stand to an organism as your childhood stands to your life as a whole. We are spatial parts of animals brains, perhaps, or temporal parts of brains. We are partless, immaterial substances, souls, as Plato and Descartes thought, and compound things made up of immaterial soul and a material body. We are collections of mental states or events, bundles of perceptions, as Hume said. Or is there nothing that we are? We just don't really exist at all. To quickly recap, we briefly went over the problems of identity. These include who one is, personhood, persistence, evidence, population, and what am I? If any of these problems sparked your interest, I suggest reading more about the theories behind each subject. We take for granted so many concepts in our language. When we sit down and think about what these words and concepts mean, they require much more thought than just a simple sentence. But for the sake of communication, we generalize many of these concepts. It works well enough to communicate, but how do we know that we're talking about the same thing? The next time you watch Alice in Wonderland and come to the caterpillar scene, you now know what she means when she replies, I hardly even know, sir. I've changed so many times since this morning. When the caterpillar asks, who are you? The problems of identity don't seem trivial until you break them down. I hope that at least once during this episode, you really had to think about one aspect I talked about. That one of those problems jumped out and made you really think about it. That's what I love about philosophy. Not that it complicates things, but it just goes to show how much we take for granted in what's being communicated to us. See, language is only part of the equation. Describing one's thoughts in effective ways, that's a whole other problem. Thanks for listening once again. I believe in the next episode, I want to take a deeper dive into the question of what it means to be human. We briefly touched on it in this episode, but I think it's a crucial question to our current political landscape. It directly pertains to things about immigration, abortion, and animal rights. Anyways, I'd like to end this episode with this thought. No concept should ever go unquestioned for too long, because that is the death of what it means to be human.